chapter 2, Revelation chapter number 2. I will also tell you that, uh, real quickly, that uh, our commercial has been attracting a lot of attention. Um, we've had 126 clicks on our website in the month of March as a result of the commercial. So, uh, and I'm told that with these commercials, typically it takes a month or two before people start responding and reacting to what they're seeing. They've got to see it a couple of times before they act upon it. But I will just say that 126 clicks to our website from the commercial is pretty good traction, I think. So praise the Lord to just continue to pray for the Lord to lead folks and uh, that they'll ask for help. Amen. So Revelation tonight, we're on lesson number 13. And last week we covered chapter 2, 1 through uh, 5 and 6, a little bit of verse 6, but we'll hit more on verse 6 and 7 tonight and um, try to get down a little bit on this and, and uh, move along to the church at Smyrna. But you've heard it said before, if I have something tough to talk about with someone, you use what's called the sandwich method. Have you ever heard that? Which basically means this, uh, if you have something to tough that you need to talk about with someone, you, you begin with, it's like a, two slices of bread, right? You, you talk about some tough things in the beginning, and then you put a little bit less tough stuff in the middle, and then you finish off by sort of uh, uh, re reviewing what you've talked about. So that's where you get the sandwich. The first piece of bread on the top is the tough stuff. The, Center is the sweeter stuff, and last thing is review. But with that thought in mind, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 6 uh, says this, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. And that's obviously verse number 6, the Lord speaking, uh, in my Bible, the words are in red, which obviously indicates that. And if you have a red letter Bible, you see that yourself as well, that the Lord was preaching, speaking here. Uh, John, the apostle, was writing, and he was writing what the Lord inspired him under the inspiration of God to write. And so uh, I want you to see that apparently the church at Ephesus had to deal with the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And so what were those deeds? Nicolaitans is only used twice in our Bibles. It's, it's found in Revelation chapter 2, verse 6, and then in Revelation chapter 2, verse 15. And the root word from this word Nicolaitans comes from the first word, Nikeo, which means to rule. And then the second part of the word, you see the word laity, or laet in there, which is lay people. And so when you put these two things together, what do you have? It's basically ruling over the laity or ruling over the lay people of the church. Uh, this was a problem in the early church. And we know that it evolved much further into very uh, many of the organized religions, especially those that were you know, Catholic or Protestant, those, uh, those uh, religions that left the Catholic Church and began their own, like the Lutherans, Episcopalians, etc., etc. They all had a problem in this area. Uh, of course, this is much later than what we're looking at here in Revelation, but to, suffice to say, it was a problem early on. And the key part of this is in that verse, Nicolaitans, is that word L-A-I-T, late, or which comes from the word that we know in our church as laity, or the common person in the fellowship or in the, in the church. Uh, look at Acts chapter 20 with me. Acts chapter 20 and verse 30. Acts 20 verse 30, but in, in verse 6, But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. And so in verse 30 of chapter 20 of the book of Acts, there's a warning, a reminder that Luke gives us in the book of Acts, because Luke was the writer of the book of Acts, and he, he reminds us in, in verse number 30 that the church was dealing with a lot of these 
falsehoods, a lot of these false things that were finding their way into the early church. And he says this in verse 30, Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, listen, to draw away disciples after them. Uh, that was a huge problem in the early church. Uh, we also know that in, in the book of Acts, there's places where uh, the, the Bible says, and I'll just quickly paraphrase, uh, you know, some are after Paul, some are after Apollos, and, and, and there was a big problem with, with, uh, with the people early on latching on to a person or a man rather than focusing their attention and their, their loyalty and their love on the Lord Jesus Christ. In that verse in Acts 20, the problem there, we see that problem at its root is what is when, when saved men begin to promote themselves above other men. That was a huge problem in the early church. It's still a problem today. Uh, we talked last week about how, the, how many churches today, some of the modern uh, churches, not so many here in this area, but definitely down in the south, uh, the, the leaders of the church promote themselves and give themselves titles that they do not deserve. Uh, titles that were reserved for uh, chosen men of God that God himself chose. And so in that verse we can see that there's still a problem going on. It started way back here in, in the early church at Ephesus. Uh, it's, it's a prevalent doctrine in the Catholic church where you have been commanded by the clergy to call them by special names. Uh, calling a priest father is anti-Bible. It's heresy. It's blasphemous at its core. Uh, you say, how can you say that? Because when I was growing up, I, I used to be in a church and, and uh, we called the, the priest father and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I did it too when I was young and didn't know a thing about the Bible. But once I began to study the Bible and began to be taught some things, I quickly understood, hey, that's the Lord himself said, don't do that. Look at Matthew 23. I'll show you from the Word of God where the Lord said, don't do that, it's not appropriate. Matthew 23. Look at verses 1 through 9. Matthew 23, verses 1 through 9. Verse 1, Jesus says this, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to the disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So right there you see in that first verse how the Pharisees and the, and the, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the scribes have already decided to elevate themselves to a higher position in the church or in the, 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 the process of religion or, or worship that they should not have done. Then it says, uh, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But listen to this next part. But do not ye after their works. They, they had a problem with telling people to do things that they themselves would not do. And so that's, that's a problem. And then he says this. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their, little, or one of their fingers. Do as I say, not as I do, in other words. But all their works they do, here it is, here's the reason, for to be seen of men. They want to make a big show in front of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at the feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But look what the Lord said. He said, but be not, uh, but be, uh, not ye called rabbi. for Because rabbi, the word rabbi means master. And the Lord says this, for one is your master, even Christ, and all ye are brethren. And call no man father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. So there you go. Uh, it's, clear as, it's clear as can be. If you know how to read English, it's there for you to see. No interpretation needed. Just read what it says. This is the thing that God hates. The deeds of the Nicolaitans, which, uh, which uh, he says there, uh, of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. 
When men elevate themselves to a super spiritual place and look down upon the lay people in the church, God said, I hate that. Taking a place between the... Because here's what happens. What they want to do is they want to elevate themselves and they want to uh, put God here and they want to put themselves here and put you here. So you have to go through them, they would say, to get to God. And that's just totally false. When the veil of the temple was rent in twain, that opened up access to the throne of grace for all Christians. You don't need a, you don't need a, a man sitting in there uh, to get to God. This is not the doctrine named after, by the way, Nicholas. Uh, I've heard that. I heard it recently. There's no truth to that. It's all speculation by secular historians. Uh, supposedly, this Nicholas was a uh, was a, uh, a a deacon in the Jerusalem church, and supposedly he's the one that championed all this. Not so. All you have to do, folks, listen, is just study the word. Know what the word means, and you'll get the answer to what God is talking about in His word most often. Uh, but He says, "I hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans." Uh, there's no biblical proof of this supposed deacon named Nicholas of the church at Jerusalem, starting the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. You know where it comes from? It's written in commentaries. It's written in commentaries. And I told you last week that many of these commentaries are written by uh, men that are not of like faith. Uh, they're men that were Protestant. They're men that were reformers. Uh, I don't know of a commentary written by an independent Baptist or by a Bible believer with no affiliation to the Protestant church or the reform movement. Most of the commentators have that affiliation. Now listen, I'm not saying that they get everything wrong, but I'm saying you've got to check them out and make sure that the Bible lines up with what they're saying. Or what, what, you know, if they're saying something contrary to the Bible, you go with the Bible. Deacons have created a large problem in many churches. Little side note. Don't get nervous, Brother David. I'm telling you, deacons create a lot of problems in Bible-believing churches. You know why they do it? Because they assume things not in biblical evidence. Many deacons assume authority without God's consent. God had one thing in mind for the office of a deacon. It's in Acts chapter number 6, verse 3. Look there with me. Talking about the deeds of the Nicolaitans where, where men in churches elevate themselves to a positions of authority that they are not supposed to be in. Acts chapter 6 verse 3. Now keep in mind, a deacon is a biblical office in the church. But it was put in place for a specific purpose. And we find this specific purpose in Acts chapter 6 verse 3. It tells us what God ordained deacons for. Look at what it says. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report. Okay, so let's, let's examine Brother David right here real quickly. Look out among you honest, seven men of honest report. David qualifies. He has an honest report. And he also meets those qualifications over there in, uh, in 1 Timothy. But then it says this, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may, listen, whom we may appoint over this business. You see that? What was this business that they were talking about? It wasn't over all business matters of the church. It was over the neglected widows. That was the business that God ordained deacons for. So if we have widows in our church, the deacon's responsibility is to see to those widows. Because why? Because their husband is gone and they need somebody to come alongside them every once in a while and help them with things that they can't do on their own. That is the sole ordained responsibility of God for a deacon. Now, you know and I know that many places in many churches, there's what they call deacon boards. Nowhere in the scriptures do you find that. 
That is all man-made stuff. Where men have assumed authority. There's a lot of churches where uh, the pastor doesn't dare breathe without the deacon board saying so. It's ridiculous. Nowhere in the Bible does that have any biblical authority or mandate. So this deeds of the Nicolaitans was far reaching in many areas of the, of the local church there at Ephesus. And God said this, I hate it. Now, just so you read, don't read anything into what I'm saying. Brother David is a faithful deacon. I love him. He's been a blessing to me. No problems. Okay? So don't think I was talking about that for any other reason than just to teach what the Bible says. Jeremiah chapter 5. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 5. Verse 31. Jeremiah 5, verse 31. The Bible says, The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests, listen, bear rule by their means. You see that? T-H-E-I-R. Their means. And look at the next part. And my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? There are many people in society, you know some of them yourself, who love it when they don't have to take responsibility for anything. You know who they are. They would, they would sooner have their toenails pulled out with a pair of needle nose pliers than take responsibility for anything. They don't want to be responsible. Jeremiah said, my people love to have it so. They love to let others lead so that when things go wrong, as they often do, they will bear no responsibility for the failure. Is there anybody you've ever met like that, Andrew? Huh? They're everywhere. And, they're, and the sad part is they're in many churches. The old saying goes, when the church is doing very well financially... Everybody's a CPA in the church. But when the church is not doing so well financially, you know what happens? Pastor, what are you going to do? Yeah. Folks, they, I'm telling you, they like to, to, uh, to put off responsibility so they don't have to share in any of the, the, the things when they go wrong. If you were to scour the entire New Testament... You cannot find anywhere that God said for the average Christian to submit themselves to a man and confess their sins to a man. Nowhere. From the first verse of Matthew all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, you will find that nowhere. So why do people so easily submit to a local priest and tell them all their dirty laundry? You know why? The people love it so. Because they're lazy on their Bible study. They're spiritually lazy. They're not following God's commandments where God said to study, to show thyself approved. You know when we lose our first love, which was the indictment that the church at Ephesus gets from the Lord, we'll see that here in a second. The indictment that he gave that church was they had left their first love. And when we do that, we allow ourselves or someone else to creep in and take the place that only God belongs in our life. We'll, we'll settle for a counterfeit, in other words. And we quickly will go off track spiritually when we start settling for a counterfeit. So let's cover one more thing in relation to verse 6 before we move on to the next verse. There's a phrase in verse 6 which causes a lot of people in our society today to be very uncomfortable. Yet the Bible says it plainly in English. Notice this. It says at the end of that verse 6, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which also I hate. That's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. It's pretty clear. 
God has no problem in saying that he hates something. People have a problem with that. Your mother probably told you like my did when I would say this. I would say, oh, mom, I'm so mad. I hate that. And my mother would say, oh, you don't hate that. You don't hate anyone. That, have you ever heard that? You ever been told that? Absolutely. But here the Bible says in verse 6, that thou hatest the deeds in it, which I also hate. So question, if God says he hates something, are we to say to God, oh God, you don't really hate anyone. We would never dream of doing that. Here's another one you hear many times. He hates the sin but loves the sinner. That sounds really spiritual. However, it's not biblical. And I'm going to show you. When we look at Scripture and we compare Scripture with Scripture and we compare the meaning of Scripture with other Scripture, we will get a clear indication of what God means with regard to some of these things He's saying here in Revelation 2 and verse 6. Look at Psalm 5. Turn to Psalm 5. We're going to look at several verses here in the next couple of minutes, so get your, 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 uh, your finger turner ready in your Bible. Psalm 5. Look at these words yourself. Psalm 5, verse 1, the Bible says, give, give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God. For unto thee will I pray. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. Now look at this next part. The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. Look at another verse, Psalm 45. We'll come back and comment on just a second, but I want you to see the, the verses first. Psalm 45. In Psalm 5, he said at the end, Thou hatest all workers of iniquity. In Psalm 45, look at verse 7 or 6. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Thou lovest righteousness and hateth wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Hebrews chapter 1. Psalm number 45, 6 and 7 at the beginning where it talks about thy throne. Whose throne is he talking about? He's talking about the throne of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at Hebrews 1 and verse 8. But unto thy son, he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Hebrews 1a is proof text of who God was speaking about in Psalm 45. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremiah 44. Jeremiah chapter 44, verse 3 and 3 through 5. We're talking about the Lord hating the workers of iniquity. The deeds of the Nicolaitans, he said, I hate. Look at verse 3 of Psalm, uh, Jeremiah 44. He said, Because of their wickedness which they have committed to provoke me to anger, in that they went to burn incense and to serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they ye nor your fathers, howbeit I sent unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not, do, uh, do not this abominable thing that I hate. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear to turn from their wickedness, to burn incense, uh, to, uh, to burn no incense unto other gods. So, what's the point? The Lord hates wickedness, 
And he says in these verses that I just read, I'm going to show you one more just to seal this thing. Not only does he hate wickedness, he hates people who do wickedness. That's what the Bible says. I'm only showing you a few verses. I could show you a whole lot more than what I've showed you already. But if someone we, listen to this, if someone we knew, and we all know somebody that's like this, is without Christ and they're lost, never been born again, and we know that if they do not receive Christ and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, believe the gospel before they die, we know, because the Bible tells us, they are going to a fiery hell when they die. Amen? Everybody okay with that? Not okay with it, but you understand it. If you've been trying to lead that person to Jesus, and someone has stepped between you and them, and they are attempting to lead them to worship some, you know, I don't know, some eight-armed monkey idol, that's not the God of heaven. Here's what they're doing. They are distracting them from the real truth of the Bible. Could you understand how God could hate that? You know, the truth is, you probably would hate it too, wouldn't you? If a loved one of yours was headed for a fiery hell because some counterfeit prophet or some counterfeit a false teacher got a hold of their attention and was distracting them away from the truth of God's word that you were trying to teach them so that they could be born again into the family of God and they could go to heaven and experience all the things that we will as believers. If they were trying to do that to somebody you cared about, you'd hate them too. The God of the Bible says he hates all workers of iniquity. If those verses are not enough, let me give you one more example. Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. Verse number 16. Proverbs 6.16. 6, These six things does the Lord, doth the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Now, let's just take these one at a time. Because God says he hates all these things. A proud look. You know, that, we could probably make an argument that that's not person-specific. But let's face it, in order for a proud look, it's got to come from somebody. A lying tongue. I don't know anybody who lies without a tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. Think about your abortion doctors. Abortion doctors fit into that camp. They're shedding the innocent blood of babies that have no way to defend themselves and they're justifying it. And God says, I hate that. I don't care what doctors say about health care and all that mess. Have you noticed since this decision came out from the Supreme Court, they're already renaming it and something, calling it now something else. They're calling it uh, taking away, uh, uh, what is it, uh, health care or some stupid thing, you know. Then he says, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Well, last time I checked, that had to be in somebody. God says he hates it. Feet that be swift to running to mischief. God says he hates it. A false witness that speaketh lies. That's a person. And he that soweth discord among the brethren. That's a person. God says he hates it. You can't separate the deed from the person. You can't separate it. Uh, 
you know, so when I said about the, the proud look, I was trying to, you know, give the liberal Bible scholars the benefit of the doubt, I guess. But the other six things or actions that we read right there in Proverbs chapter uh, uh, 6 cannot dis be disassociated from a person. Here's what we need to do. We need to let God's own words define who God is. We need to let God's own words define who He really is according to the Word of God and stop allowing our worldly exposure to define the God of the Bible. Now, understand, I'm not going to take pleasure in going out and telling somebody, you know what, God hates that when you do that. He hates you when you do it. I mean, nobody wants to do that. But that's what the Bible says. Look at Revelation 2, verse 7. Here the Bible says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. We're not going to talk about the tree of life tonight. We're going to talk about that a little bit later down the road. But what we will talk about about verse 7 tonight is this. One last thing before we get done. Last week, Brother David asked me a question after service. Because we've told you that for years and years of Bible study for me, I had heard men say, I have read commentators who said, and I had studied myself, and I thought I had an understanding of who the angel of the church was in each of these letters. Because they all begin the same. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. Unto the angel of the church of Smyrna. So on and so on and so on. And last week I had, well not last week, a couple weeks ago I told you that I no longer believed what I had also believed for so long. I've changed my thought on this. You don't have to agree. I'm just telling you what my thought is. I don't believe anymore that that is the pastor of the church that is being spoken to. I believe it's what Revelation 1 and verse 20 says it is. The angel of the church. Who's the angel of the church? I don't know. But the Bible says that's what it is. So I'm going to just believe what the Bible says. I'm not going to try to make it something more than what I can prove from the Scripture. So he asked me last week, if, if the angel in the passage that we read in chapter 2, verse 1, if the angel is not the pastor, how are the people going to know what's being said? Well, if you look at verse 7, it tells you. It says, He that hath an ear, let him hear, what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So how are the people in the church going to know? The Spirit of God is going to speak to them. How is the Spirit of God going to speak to them? Through the Word of God. There's not a church anywhere that I know of today that doesn't have access to this Bible unless they're in a foreign country where Bibles are illegal or something. But here in America, there's no reason why anybody in a church can't have access to this book. So when you think about it, the Bible said to the angel of the church. He didn't say to the pastor of the church. One of the letters a little bit further, we're going to see one of the pastors called out by name. And that's Pastor Polycarp. If he met pastors instead of angels, why didn't he just say pastors? If he calls one of the pastors out by name, why didn't he call them all out by name? Stick to what the Bible says. If Jesus was writing to the angels of the churches, which is what the Bible says, how did the churches get the message? They listened to what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So today, how does God speak to us? Through his word. Through the Bible. This is God's love letter to his children. 
Everything that His children need to know is contained right here. And if it's not contained here, God's decided we don't need to know right now. So how does He speak? Through His Word. How do we come to the right understanding? We are guided by the words of the Bible, precept upon precept. And we're guided by the Holy Spirit into all understanding that we need to have as His kids. We pray for understanding. When you see a passage of Scripture, you study and you compare words with other words and you, you, you look here and you look there and you look to the Old Testament, the New Testament, and you dig and you dig and you dig and you pray through the process and you allow the Spirit of God to give you that peace in your heart that you're in the right spot. That's how we're supposed to do it. But here's how the modern Christian does it. They read a verse of Scripture, and they'll say, hmm, I don't get that. Brother David, what do you think that means? Brother David says, well, I think it means X. Yeah, me too. I think so too. Now, Brother David may be exactly right, but guess what? He may not be. You stand before God one day and you say, well, Brother David told me. God's going to say, I, I don't care what Brother David told you. What do you think? It's a personal accountability that we have to remember. That's why you're saved personally. I can't save anyone. You can't save anyone. Everyone has to come to Christ the same way. Who is verse 7 speaking to? Well, we know Revelation is written to the servants of God according to Revelation 1 and verse 1. So that means anyone who is saved, reading and studying their Bible, praying and asking for God's guidance, and serving in their local church. Now that doesn't mean everyone's going to teach Sunday school, everyone's going to preach, everyone's going to sing in the choir, or whatever. But you're serving in some capacity in your church. For what? For the edification of the body of Christ. This book of Revelation is written for our learning. So you know what Revelation 2 and verse 7 says? You better listen. You better listen. That language follows every one of these letters. If we went to the, the church at Smyrna, when we would go down to uh, verse 11, chapter 2, verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be heard of the second death. Each one of these uh, uh, closing statements on each of these churches tells you to listen, and you better be an overcomer, and then there's another little tidbit at the end of each of these. So let's summarize real quickly. God commended the church at Ephesus for uh, five things. He commended them there in verse number two, Ephesus uh, chapter, or excuse me, Revelation 2.2. 2, he said, I know thy works. God commended the church for their works. And then he said, and thy labor. You know what? It takes labor to do work. Amen? Sadly, a lot of folks, the only work they do is with their mouth. You know, the gonna doers. I'm gonna do that. But labor has to come into play. He commended them for that. Then he said, thy patience. He commended them for their patience. The word patience in your Bible oftentimes refers to and is speaking about your ability to bear up under pressure. Think about a pillar that holds up a building. If it's made out of rubber, it's not going to hold too much. Amen? Sadly, what we're doing today is we're raising a bunch of young men who aren't able to bear up. But God said, Ephesus had this going on. 
They were able to bear up under the persecution. Remember, we talked about this early on. Ephesus was not a godly place. There was all kinds of wickedness, all kinds of things going on. But the church at Ephesus was commended by the Lord for being able to bear up. Not only could they bear up, he also said, How canst not bear them which are evil? Ephesus was calling out evil men in their midst. They weren't just saying, well, you know, if we criticize them, we're not going to be able to win them to the Lord. No, they were calling them out and they wouldn't bear it. They wouldn't allow it. We got too many churches today of bearing evil. Putting up with things that shouldn't be put up with. God said Ephesus had it going on. They were doing the right thing. And then he said, we're trying them who said they were apostles and we're not. We went through all that last week. And then finally, he commended them because they hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which we talked about tonight. Those five things God said, you guys have got it going on. You're doing the right thing. Keep up the good work. All those were good things they were doing. But the one thing he had an issue with, with the church at Ephesus, was they had left their first love. The one thing. Why is that important? Because we said to you last week, when you leave your first love, when you leave the thought process that Christ is your all in all, and everything you're doing in your spiritual life is because of what Christ has done for you, you love Him so much because He saved you. He died for us. He died for the church. He, he, he gave us great hope for our future. We have eternal life because of what Christ did for us. When you think about it, we ought to be loving Him. We ought to be loving Him passionately. But the Ephesus folks... Because they were bearing up, because they were laboring and working and, and trying the, uh, the false apostles and all the things that were going on and trying to stay and keep the church going in the midst of a wicked place, guess what they had done? They forgot the main reason why they were there. To love the Lord. And to be that, have the love of the Lord be their testimony. They said, we're working. We're laboring. We're being patient. But God said, no, one thing you're not doing. You've left thy first love. They hadn't lost it, but they'd left it. It's kind of like a marriage. When you start putting a marriage on autopilot, and you stop doing the things you used to do, folks, listen, it happens a lot easier than you think. The busyness of life catches up to us and we stop doing things that we ought not stop doing. That was the thing that the Lord had issue with Ephesus. And despite all the good things they were doing, they were missing one of the most important. Leaving their first love. We don't want to do that. Every once in a while we've got to take a step back and say, I've got to get refocused on the right thing here. Because all this busyness, I've, I've lost sight of some things. Apparently, it hadn't happened to the extent that they'd lost their testimony completely because God commended them on some things. You know what happens a lot of times in a Christian's life? They, they leave their first love. They forget why they're doing what they're doing for the cause of Christ because of the love that they're supposed to show and have. They forget it because they get busy doing all kinds of things. I told you last week that the church at Ephesus, if you were to go to the location where the church at Ephesus front door was, you would not find the church anymore. The Bible says that either get it right, get back to your first love, Ephesus, or I'm going to remove thy candlestick. Well, apparently, the church at Ephesus didn't get right the way God wanted them to. Because you know why? The church at Ephesus is no more. 
The only evidence of the church at Ephesus ever being there is a bunch of ruins, a pile of bricks. People visit it because it's a historic site, but the church is no longer there. You don't see the church preaching the Word of God anymore. You don't see souls being saved there in the church. It's gone. And that would be a lesson to us. We can apply those principles to Faith Baptist Church. If we start losing our love for the Lord and we start losing our love for the things that He thinks are important and start focusing them on the things that we think they're important, we better watch out because we're in danger. I believe there's a lot of churches that are operating in this country tonight and on Sunday that are just going through the motions. The Lord left a long time ago. We don't want that to be our testimony. Amen. Father, thank you for an opportunity tonight that we've had to look into thy word. Help us, Father, as we study and go through this great book. What a blessing to have this book to study. And Father, we pray tonight that you'll help us to be mindful of the things that we learn and that we'll not only learn them, but we'll put them into practice in our own life. Help us tonight, Father, as we go. Give us safety as we travel home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.